Live to see it, friends. Let's talk about going to the moon. We've just marked the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, the first moon landing, and now it's time to ask a few questions. Why did we go to the moon? Why did we go then? Why haven't we been back since the early 70s? Are we going to go back now? If we do, how's it going to be different than when we went the first time? Lots of things to think about. What is the impact of the original moon landing, and what does it mean for us going forward? Let's discuss on this edition of The World Transformed. Live to see it, friends, and welcome to The World Transformed. My name is Phil Bowermaster, and with me in the virtual studio is my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Hello, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? Well, I am super fantastic. How are you, my friend? Man, I am great. And uh, glad to be back at it, man. And we're back. So we had a, a sort of longer hiatus than usual, but uh, it's good to be back doing the show. We had to come back because of this particular topic. This is one we've been looking forward to for quite some time, and we're about a week after the event, so that gives us a little bit of a little bit of perspective on this. But we're talking about the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 on today's show, and. I don't know. There's a there's a lot that's been said, but I feel that uh, we've got some perspective to add on this as well. Stephen, how did you how did you mark the day? How did you commemorate well, Apollo 11? At space.com, they uh, actually allowed you to kind of you know experience it in real time with a 50 year delay, right? Right. And yeah. uh, so on on the 50 year 50th anniversary of the uh, of the taking off of Apollo 11, you get to watch it, and uh, and then you get to see the landing. Uh, uh, several days later, and then, uh, you know, um, various other things along the way, and, of course, them, uh, the homecoming. So I watched the taking off and uh, also the landing. I did not uh, work intervenes, and I could not see them the splashdown. Uh, but that was cool. That, that kind of lent, lent some perspective uh, to, uh, you know, how, how uh, other people experienced it 50 years ago. So uh, that was, that was, I thought that was pretty cool. I, I was born uh, just, you know, a couple months after this happened. Uh, I guess I've just revealed I'm looking at 50 here in a couple of months. So anyway, but that's the deal. I, I, I really enjoyed doing that. That was cool. So you're actually, this is where you and I, one of the big differences between you and I, Steve, this could, this could be, this could be the big difference right here. Okay. Is for you, Apollo 11 has always been in the rear view mirror, right? It's always been passed for me. I actually remember it. I remember watching it on TV and uh, last week on YouTube on the day of the moon landing and, and the, uh, and the moon walk, they rebroadcast just the live feed from CBS. It's like they had the whole thing on yeah. video, and it was like you just you can watch it as people watched it on TV. Is that is that what they were doing on Space.com? Or yeah, yeah, that, and they were just pointing to those things. Yes, like, that's pretty yeah. much what they were doing. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually rewatching what my family and I watched 50 years ago. Right? What what I you know as a kid. You, you know what I mean? It's like I was um, let's see seven going on seven i was six years old when it happened and i'm watching this and you hear the historic audio in the background you hear the landing and stuff that you maybe have seen at different times and of course you know what's coming eventually they're going to say houston tranquility base the eagle has landed right you're, you're you're looking forward to that audio clip and what's funny is on cbs they were walter cronkite and crew they had timed their models and their little simulation animation and stuff that they were showing based on the NASA clock. So right. So there was nothing live they were showing, right? There, there was no way to show the capsule landing on the moon. There was no there was no live feed from the LEM, nothing like that. So they're just, you know, they're showing their animations. They're showing artists' conception of what might be happening right now. But it's timed perfectly. NASA said this procedure has started now. And therefore, we know that this is exactly where we are, and this is exactly where we are, and this is exactly where. So it was actually, you know, for network TV of the late 1960s, really precision, precision timing they were using to to make this thing happen. And then, as you're listening, you can hear the audio, and Neil is saying, "Up 30, you know, over 40." It says critical last few seconds, and oh, yeah. the thing, and and the title appears on the screen: lunar orbit or uh, lunar module on the moon. We've landed, and Walter Cronkite's going, "Well, we've landed on the moon." You can hear Neil in the background, and they're still landing it, right? And it, and it was because of that. Um, 
what occurs there at the last 39 seconds, which is when they got to the place where they were supposed to drop the lem, eh, it wasn't a good place to land. There were some rocks yeah, around. Rocks, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was, well, it was of course, and, they, they had taken control, or Buzz had taken control of the limb earlier than that, before, before he saw the rock, because of yes. a computer glitch, right? Oh, that's yeah. right. That's right. So that probably added some time as well. And then there was, right. there was an additional uh, 39 seconds of, of, of Buzz finding, finding the right place to land. So it took those guys a few minutes to realize that it hadn't quite happened yet. They've announced it's happened. And we're like, wow, we've landed on the moon. And then it's like, ah, then it really happened. And I had yeah. no memory of that. And I hadn't read that anywhere, that it got reported wrong like that. It was, it was really that's, interesting. That's kind of cool, that isn't it? Yeah, that's kind of cool to get to see it. You get, we have the perspective of history uh, to get it right. But uh, that, that's cool that they did it that way and showed that it was a little bit off. Cool. And you can tell it's off because you hear what's happening in the background. You go, oh, I've heard this before. They haven't landed yet. That's, yeah, they haven't <laughs> landed until, until he says the, the line. And, and, and the other funny thing is Cronkite almost talks over the line, right? He almost is yeah. talking when, when, they, when they actually do land, but he manages to shut up just at the right minute. And a few minutes, uh, well, hours later when they're doing the spacewalk, same thing. Neil is finally <laughs> down on the moon and Walter he's Cronkite on the all. ladder he's on the ladder you know, he, yeah. <laughs> sounds like him, the most exactly. famous yeah. line in history he almost steps on it doesn't he he uh, almost he almost stepped on it and interestingly after he delivered it this is the state of the technology at the time he says well i heard the first part something about a small step for man but i couldn't make out the rest and we're all going yeah. oh no you couldn't hear it we <laughs> heard i hear it and recognize it i'm wondering was it that garbled was it that hard to hear i don't know stuff that well just, and of course important. there's the uh the a man controversy versus man controversy, right? Uh, and of course, to this day, uh, NASA says it was one small step for a man, one yes. giant leap for mankind. And of course, that's the line we ought to take, right? That's what uh, was meant to be said. And if he uh, if he dropped uh, an article adjective because he was excited about being on the moon, we ought to forgive him that and just take the line as written. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you know what? I've always I've always thought that was as big a nothing burger of a controversy as you could have. Yeah, oh, either, yeah. Okay. absolutely. Worst case yeah. is Neil muffed his line. It's like, yeah. all right, so he got to the moon, but he didn't say his words quite right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna, if we're gonna ever there was that, a give so. the man a break <laughs> moment, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, in the uh, you, you know, if, if you or I, Phil, had been in his shoes, okay, it would have been like, wow, I'm on the moon. Can you believe yeah, this? Exactly. <laughs> Or something, you know, something stupid, you know. I would, and then oh, 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 uh, that's one small step. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. Ex well, exactly. I, I don't know, you know if you've ever seen it, but uh, actually, it was making the rounds on social media. And this being a family show, we won't uh, we won't repeat any of that kind of language. But check out how the Onion covered it. Okay, what the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I what the have. headline uh, was, yeah, and what yeah. the first words were, and I'd be more along. That, <laughs> Steve, Steve Green linked to it uh, earlier uh, in the in the week, so um, because that actually captures the emotional uh, uh, impact of it, you know. Um, yeah, what, yeah it, you, you could almost forgive Neil had he had he even said something like had he that. Said that. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, right. exactly. But but I think even even if even if he was supposed to say a and he I mean he was supposed to say a but even if he didn't say it even if it wasn't an audio clip <laughs> you can still hear it the right way I mean it's right. like for man meaning man the species and then mankind yeah. meaning man the you know I understand that man can also mean mankind there's a lot of ambiguity in language so what good grief yeah. everybody knew what he meant right so and I, there was I, a static I, pop right where the a should be so I I'm, I'm going to just say he said it you know I uh, think he probably said it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I agree, um, yeah. but uh, huge moment, huge moment. How huge? That's the question. Now it's it's fifty years in the past. I was thinking about this. We are now as far from the moon landing as that event was from World War One. Okay, so wow. a long yeah. time ago, you know, it's a long time ago. You know, uh, state of the yeah. art of uh, aerospace was biplanes fifty years prior to that. Yeah, I mean, they, exactly. it was it was uh, it was a huge undertaking at that time, and and the, what they did, they had no business doing with the state of technology at that time, but yet they did it because they felt the need to. I think uh, to beat I think the it Soviets. Was, it, it it was clearly not beyond our means to do it. It, we were capable of doing it. Maybe what we weren't capable of doing, and we'll get to this in a minute, was doing it sustainably, to use a word that yeah. gets used too much. 
these days, but but maybe right. we weren't ready to put an ongoing relationship with outer space into place at that point. Although we right. we tried. I mean, we we made an effort even for it to seem kind of like that. But it was it was designed not to create infrastructure in space, and it was designed not to not to do things repeatedly. It was designed to figure out a way to get one rocket to get you to the moon. That, that, was, the, that was the key. It was, it was so that you didn't have to build a space station in Earth orbit. You didn't have to build a space station in lunar orbit. All you had to do was launch one big, big rocket, and you got a self-contained trip to the moon. Brilliant right. engineering, actually. Um, one, one, of the, one of the most amazing feats of engineering ever. But, yeah, it was definitely a little bit ahead of its time. And it, and it goes to show you what, what a good kind of war by other means can do because ha- had we not been in that global conflict with the soviets over communism if we ha- had the cold war not been going on would we have done it would could it possibly have happened that soon absolutely not it's uh you know there's a, this is kind of silly phil but do you remember the uh the line from tombstone where he said uh you know maybe poker's not your game uh yeah. i know let's have a spelling contest well yeah. it's sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, maybe nukes is not our game. Well, let's have a uh, let's have a nerd contest and uh, right. see, see who can right. nerd uh, nerd themselves to the moon first. It's sort of uh, our German themselves to the moon. Uh, we our Germans are better, right? That's, uh, well, yeah, that had a lot to do with it. Yeah, and and our German was the one big rocket guy. So you know, for sure that <laughs> yeah. uh, that helped us a lot. I I think that that there's something to be said for the conflict from which it arose. And it's possible that had that not been going on, we still wouldn't have been to them. Right? Well, We'd you know, and here's the thing. We, we had to have World War II as well. Without World War II, we would have still been in, incremental improvements on the technology from World War I, you know? Yeah. And uh, we would, uh, so World War II just, I mean, absolutely uh, pushed us forward te- technologically. And then armed with the scientists that uh, we claimed at the end of the war and with the need to do it to beat the Soviets, we, we went. And that's, uh, I think all of that is absolutely necessary. What do you think so. in terms of how big a moment in human history is it? Biggest thing ever? Top ten? Top five? What do you? Where, where would you? Where would you put it? Where would you put landing on the moon? You know, uh, it's funny. The whenever we whenever we look at something difficult and say, well, if we put a man on the moon. Uh, why right. not? That's right. uh, to some extent, it's important for just having that phrase in our arsenal of things to say when when we're yes. faced with something difficult. Right? We don't we don't shirk from things just because they're hard. Uh, <laughs> Uh, sometimes uh, Kennedy would say we do it because it's hard, right? It's uh, you know it's 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 those things that uh, um, uh, we we uh, that really push us forward, and we need to do those things. Uh, there's also you could say there's a negative aspect to this legacy because it seems like everybody has the wrong idea about going to the moon. Uh, you know, there's how many how many programs have there been to return to the moon? You know, are, are at least proposed by President since Apollo. You know, they always <laughs> generally they say, OK, we're going to do it in 10 years. And of course, they're out of office and the next president uh, conveniently forgets it. And uh, it never happens. It's you true. Know, we just, uh, and that's the difference between the Cold War. The first president who said we do it in 10 years got it right when it was hardest, right. when it was least right. likely. And he died a couple of years after saying it. So and he, I think that's another thing you need to point out. It was almost a memorial program. In you some know? ways, yeah. Yeah, if, <laughs> if, if it hadn't had World War II, if we hadn't had the Soviets, uh, cold, you know, Cold War with the Soviets, if Kennedy had not been shot, you know, maybe we didn't go in 69. You know? Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's, yeah. There's a lot of ifs there. So it's an interesting thing. In terms of trying to scope the, well, scope the scope of it, I suppose, if, if that's a fair way of saying it, I was thinking about this the other day because we talked a while back about did, did we really lose the space race and we just moved the goalposts and then got to say we won? But it's okay. Cause yeah, we kind of we kind of called it. Right? We, we kind of called the finish line, didn't we? We we played, and 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 it's interesting. And this is this is interesting behind the scenes. Kennedy called in his science advisors and said, "Okay, what can we do faster than the Soviet?" And, right. and they were saying, "Well, no, we can't do a space station faster than them. They're going to beat us to the space station, probably." Yeah, we can go to the moon, and uh, we think if we, we can push it. We can go to the moon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we could probably exactly. Beat them. Yeah. It was the thing we could do, but they, as as you noted last time we talked about this, they took the bait, and so that did become the race. However, yeah. I was thinking about this the other day, and I was thinking, well, is this really the big shining achieving moment? Is this really the big thing? And I think maybe it is actually. Yeah, uh, not to take anything away from Sputnik or from Gagarin, because those are both huge, huge moments. 
But I actually think for man, this, for this man is a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is when we got somewhere. We didn't just go into space. We went somewhere. I mean, low Earth orbit is arguably somewhere. But you know what I mean? We went somewhere else, right? We, we yeah. went to someplace besides the Earth and still so part of put, our system. Put, put France on another world, you know, you yeah. say. Exactly. So I think I think because of that, because it was our first actual venture from this world to another world, that's why that's why this one stands out, and that's why it's it's memorable in a way that nothing else that has been done in space and nothing else that's happened in history compares to it. It is right. it, it is a, a unique accomplishment in human history, and that's that it's something that should and I hope will be remembered thousands of years from now that this the, the, in some ways a new era of human history as over the top as that sounds actually started that day that yeah. that we took the first step towards whatever else we're going to do in the in the cosmos on on that day so you know the, another historical thing happened in 69 uh, Phil other than you know my birth of course but uh <laughs> There's Woodstock, another thing. Yeah, lots of things. Yeah, well, no, no. It's um, the connection of the first two nodes that eventually became the internet. Oh, is that right? Oh. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, so should we? Uh, let's have a, a you know quick discussion. Uh, we don't, you know, got a couple other things we want to hit. But you know, which was more important, Phil? The uh, birth of the internet, or you know, you could arguably say it was in '69, or uh, going to the moon. It's hard to say. Well, that's a tough one because. Uh, certainly for, for the civilization that we currently have, for the world we currently live in, nothing's more important than the Internet, right? How are we right. even having this conversation right now, Stephen? Yeah, um, exactly. How has anyone ever listened to our show? Um, how, did, how do you and I even know each other? Right. It, it, exactly. it, it's all de it's all dependent on it's all dependent on the internet. So in in terms of in, in terms of day to day impact on our lives, and certainly the future that that we're rushing into, that's that's bigger. I agree. That's a that's a that's a bigger yeah. development. But but it's possible that a thousand years from now, from a certain perspective, we'll see Apollo Eleven as bigger, or maybe even a hundred right. years from now, we'll see it and we'll see it as bigger. We'll we'll, we'll recognize both. Ah, boy, it's it's that's a great little conundrum you raised there. Actually, yeah. maybe we should do a, we should do a show about that, marking the uh, the fiftieth uh, <laughs> of the internet. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. The fiftieth anniversary of the internet because that is big. I'm not going to say it's not big. It is yeah. it is completely huge. Well, I couldn't have watched that coverage on YouTube right without the internet. I mean, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so yeah, and, uh, for uh, for mo most people that came of age in the '80s and '90s, uh, Phil, um, you know they didn't even know about the internet until maybe 94, 95, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's and right. uh, so it, it might come as a surprise to our listeners that, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was being assembled as early as 69. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, that's, uh, it, it was, and it was connection of two uh, universities in California. I believe. So, uh, Stanford there you go. Canada, so. Well, so truly the beginning of our era in more ways than one. And, Right. And one sort of obviously has completely overtaken the other. That's for sure. The one that no one had heard of it. That it's like the mammals replacing the dinosaurs in some ways with, uh, with yeah. the space program and and the internet. But I want to talk about this. Uh, I've, I've linked to this piece by Ayn Rand. She wrote a piece for I think it was the Los Angeles Times. Her observations on watching the the moon landing. And I want to read this little section. I think this is interesting. She wrote that we had seen a demonstration of man at his best. No one could doubt. This was the cause of the event's attraction and of the stunned, numbed state in which it left us. And no one could doubt that we had seen an achievement of man in his capacity as a rational being, an achievement of reason, of logic, of mathematics, of total dedication to the absolutism of reality, I like that phrase. How many people would connect these two facts? I do not know. So... I was thinking about that. You know, we've talked a lot about over the last couple of years reality, about one of the potential downsides of the internet, one of the potential downsides of the web culture, the social media culture that we have today, is that it lets us kind of cloister ourselves off in our own realities. We get to create our own realities, and then we get to go live in those realities. But before that, maybe landing on the moon kind of put us into into a different reality. It started a new stage. It put us into a world that we hadn't lived in before. Now we live in this age where we all get to build our own reality. But that is not the reality of the absolutism of reality. It's something almost kind of scary about that, about that phrase. But, but there's an absolute reality 
that you have to address if you're going to get from the Earth to the moon. I think part of what Ian Rand was alluding to is that she was she was saying the absolutism of non-religious uh, scientific worldview. Objective and, physical and, reality. That's what she. Yeah, that's about. right. She's talking about that. She's you know a complete rejection of a religious worldview in favor of objective reality. So uh, you know, and I find that interesting uh, in that there's there's something to be said for you know the people that 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 were behind the program. But you know what, the astronauts that actually experienced it going to the moon and going into space and everything, a, a large percentage of them describe it in, uh, in religious overtones. You know, it's yes. like uh, it's, it's a religious terms, terms experience. That she would not that. approve of, yes. That's uh, yeah, exactly. She, it would make her very uncomfortable, uh, you know, that Buzz took communion on the moon and that, uh, you know, they read the, the, the book of Genesis, you know, and uh, on Apollo 10, I believe. Uh, well, you know, it's, Apollo 8. It, Read the yeah, read okay. the uh, re- re- read the article. She references that and disapproves of it. Uh, uh, sure. Okay, okay, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised that she disapproved. It. <laughs> it, it, for, for the guys that experienced uh, the you know the trip, it was uh, it was a religious experience. You know, the the scientists that put them there were probably back home shaking their heads. Even then, I guess we experienced reality in different ways, didn't we? So uh, I, 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 that's always been true. Yeah, that's that's yeah. true. The 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 social media YouTube didn't create the fact that people live in different realities, right? It's just right. it's allowed us to really go nuts with that, right? To really <laughs> to, to to really take that to the to to the next level. But but I think there I think there is something to be said for the idea that there is a there's a flavor of reality that we don't get to make. It's the old the bus that's going to run into you, right? It's you know that 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 reality is the one you have to contend with if you're going to get to the moon. Right. It's not a well. I think the moon is two hundred twenty-five thousand miles away, and you think it's sixty thousand miles away, and we're you know we'll agree to disagree. Right. You you can't have that. You can't right, have that right. relativism. Well, and not go to the moon. You got you had to know down to the foot almost how far away it was. Right. Uh, to, to 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 accomplish the task, you have to. There has to be agreed upon parameters <laughs> and something yeah, so scientific. That, that right? fact, a very basic yeah. one, among tens of thousands of those kinds of things. Right. That that all yeah, have exactly. to be that all have to be cataloged and known and thought about. And, and this mathematically defined, mathematically precision reality that uh, CBS counted on that uh, they had to, that they had to step away from a, a little bit. So, you know, I think, I, I think about our discussions about, well, there's the moon landing deniers, right? Uh, yeah. There's the flat earthers. There's the, you know, all these, all these uh, kind of conspiracy theory realities that, uh, that, that people create and they live in. Here's the problem with creating, you know, your own anti-vax reality or your own flat Earth reality or something like that. Are those folks ever going to get us to the moon, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I'd accept a ride to Walmart for, with those guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, they probably, you they probably to want the, to talk about the mice that are running in the engine or something. You know, they, the gnomes that. Uh, the magic gnomes that make uh, transportation by ground possible. Uh, those, those guys. I don't know. It, it's the, yeah. You're exactly right, though, Phil. The, they uh, you got to, you got to have a, a strong a grasp of objective reality to do these you know scientific things. You can't you can't uh, you, you can't be living in your own world to the extent that you're unex, you know uh, you're unwilling to believe what what is objective truth uh, in order yeah. to go. So. Yeah, exactly. everybody gets to live in their own reality, but only some realities are going to take us to the moon or accomplish lots of other things too. I think it's a, it's it's an interesting demonstration of that. And here's the other interesting thing she said in her essay. I, I this this got my attention. She said it is said that without the quote unlimited resources of the government, such an enormous project would not have been undertaken. No, it would not have been at this time, but it would have been when the economy was ready for it. And that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about a sustainable approach to the moon and it falls in line with what we've said before about how these days businesses do what once only superpowers could do and that eventually private it really was saying saying that uh, you know at some point the economy and the private enterprise would have would have allowed for it for it and uh looks like it's going to happen phil doesn't it well we've got this headline elon musk says spacex could land on the moon in two years a NASA executive says we'll partner with them and we'll get there faster if the company can pull it off, right? So, so there it is right there. Uh, you, 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 give, give us the line, Phil, uh, from Elon. I love this. Oh, yeah. Uh, Elon Musk said, I love this, 
it may literally be easier to just land Starship on the moon than to try to convince NASA that we can. So, you know. <laughs> you know, NASA is very much committed to their own program, right, their own rocket. And, uh, and of course, it won't fly until after, uh, uh, after Musk says he can put uh, the Starship on the moon, right? So That's right. <laughs> SLS isn't even scheduled to fly until 2021. Musk says he could have us on the moon by then. But I thought it was very interesting. This is kind of a turning of the tide here where it was, at least some NASA people are saying, yeah, well, maybe we'll partner with them. Maybe they can do it. If we want to get there that yeah. fast, maybe they're the guys to talk to. That's a, that's a you know what it just reminds me of? Change. Uh, it reminds me of the government program to decode the human genome and then Craig Venter. Almost, and and I would say arguably did overtake it. And of course, uh, and so at some point, um, you know, Bill Clinton uh, said, you know what, let's call it a tie. Um, you know, and and he announced it was done, even though it was just quote a rough draft at that point. Right. Uh, right. It had had it really gone to a you know a full decoding of the human genome, I think Craig Venter would have would have beat the the government program, and that's why I think Bill Clinton did what he did. He, you know, Probably, he, he, you know, yeah. he did what presidents do. They, uh, they, uh, they you know, announce the finish line. You know that uh, that is most beneficial. Um, and, you know, like Kennedy did. But uh, yeah, the Kennedy esque move. Hey, he was Kennedy esque <laughs> after all. Good for you. <laughs> it's a it's a great point though because yeah, talk about talk about something that is purely an information technology challenge. That's really what the gene code comes down to. And right. who better to solve that kind of problem? than a technologist, right? Uh, some, right? Somebody who works works in IT. They came along and, and they won the race. Well, this big industrial stuff has really been, uh, you know, especially the military industrial type industrial stuff has really been under the supervision of the big government agencies for so long. But you see the same, you're exactly right, Steve. You see the exact same kind of change here. You see the same yeah. kind of flipping here. It's like, yeah. well, and it's partly because of datafication. It's partly because Elon Musk always recognizes everything he's doing is basically kind of a big computer project. I mean, he sees the he sees the Tesla as a basically a data device, right? That's that's well, how he views it. Give it, us know. the example from your book, Phil, of the uh, of of the jet engine. And uh, he, he, Phil has written a book, guys, uh, since uh, we've. Uh, last had a show uh what's the name yeah of your we're book? gonna it's called a matter of days we're going to be doing a show about it here in the in the very near future but that is that that is a really good example this cfm leap aircraft engine that ge put out a while ago um let me, let me just read a quote here it reduces nox, noxious emissions by 50 percent it's quieter it weighs 500 pounds less it's smaller um smaller lighter cheaper more powerful, smaller in every way except for one. It produces about 10 times the data footprint of the previous version of the engine. It's probably in real time uh, altering the, uh, the fuel flow and everything. All, all the parameters are being altered in real time to meet the demands, and it allows exactly. it to be that much more efficient. And, of course, you, you multiply that by practically every part that goes into a rocket that would take us to the moon. And, you know, eventually you get somewhere with that, right? Yeah. When you turn any project, any engineering project into an information technology project, when you turn it into a, a digital project, you get the advantages, the, the exponential jumps and the economies of scale that the digital world brings, even to something like an aircraft engine or even to something like going to the moon. This is, this is Elon Musk's advantage, is that he is taking an information science approach to everything he does, to building cars, to aerospace, and, and it's why he can, in all seriousness, say, look, you want to get to the moon? I'll get you there in two years, right? Forget 10 years. I'll get you there in two years. Is NASA going to take him up on it? I, you know, maybe with Trump in the White House, they might, right? Maybe yeah. something will happen there. But even if they don't, he'll do it. And it's possible they'll get smart enough and do a Bill Clinton and say, hey, yay, it's a NASA project, right? right at the very yeah, last well, you know, at the last minute, they, they put, you know, NASA astronauts on it and, and take credit. It, that's, that would be the smart political move, right? And, and we'll, see, we'll see what happens. I would, I would just recommend on this subject, Brian Wong has written a great piece over at Next Big Future. SpaceX is the only real option for human landing on the moon by 2024, which he sees, I think, you know, five years out as maybe a more realistic time frame than – than two years out, but yeah, there's Elon time. You know, Elon uh, speaks 
you know, he, he, opt, optimistically, uh, not, uh, he, I, you know, he's not lying. He's just extremely optimistic <laughs> to he's, the point he's that he's very optimistic. There's something to be said about unrealistic time frames. That's part of what made Apollo 11 happen. That right. uh, if, if Kennedy had said, we'll do it in 30 years, we'd have probably never done it. Um, yeah. it he, he said we'd do it in 10 years and we did it. So maybe two years is the right number. Maybe we should be shooting to get back to the moon in two years, but I'll certainly settle for five. If uh, right. if they can if they can get us there if they can get us there in five years, and if it's a SpaceX rocket that says NASA on it or whatever combination, I really don't care. Um, but I hope it's us. Um, I hope we I, I hope we don't get beaten to the moon by someone else here in the next in the next few years, which is another possibility we've talked about in other shows. Of course, even if they do. All they're racing to be is second to the moon, right? Uh, <laughs> Hopefully, the, this next time we go to the moon will be analogous to when we went to the, uh, the South Pole uh, uh, for a second time, right? Because, you know, the race to the South Pole was just, you know, you could say that it was an elaborate stunt, right, to say that yep. we had been to the South Pole. When we went back, we went back with a base, and we've been, uh, you know, at the South Pole ever since. And the science that's been done that, down there has been awesome. And uh, and it's been worth being there. And uh, that's that's you know maybe that's what we need. We when we go back to the moon, we need to have a compelling reason to go. And there are reasons to go to the moon. There are good reasons to be there. And but we need to actually be building the infrastructure that you know. Okay, now we're on the moon, and it will allow us to do all these other things. Therefore, we we have a compelling reason to be here and to stay here. And that's right. that's, that's what we need to you know going forward. It, we don't need to stunt anymore, or or just to say, hey, we beat the Soviets. That's, you know, we beat the Soviets. Now we yeah, that's over and done with. Yeah, that's to a, stay. That. I like that phrase. I think that's right. We're going back to stay. We're going back to space to stay because right. that's where we belong, and that's where we started to demonstrate that 50 years ago. So I think it's a it's a it's a grand achievement. It's, it was fun to have the anniversary. We had a little get together. We had some. We we were actually getting together with some friends, and we made it an Apollo 11 party, and that was fun. We did a cake, and it was just nice. It was nice to see the awareness of my kids of how how big a deal this was as as they became aware of it. And it's something. It's a memory we need to keep alive, and it's something we need to continue to celebrate. But I think it's a it's an excellent point that it's not just of the past. That this is something that is an example to us for what we can accomplish going forward. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next in the story of humans on the moon. And with that, Stephen, I will say uh, it's great uh, talking with you. It's great having you all with us. We are going to be back soon with another brand new show. And until next time, live to see it. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. Please click the subscribe button below and you'll get an update every time we have a new video out. Also, check out some of our archive videos. You know, we've done more than 800 shows, so you got a lot of catching up to do. Better get started.